Hi everybody, we're going to get started. Welcome to the Center on the Legal Profession Speaker Series. As you know, we try to invite lots of different types of um, lawyers and people that work in the legal services market from all over the world to come to these. And um, this spring, we've been focusing on women lawyers um, and uh, women in the legal marketplace or that have a law background. Uh, today we have with us Lori Silvers. And Lori Silvers definitely has a legal background. In fact, today she told me something that I was surprised about because she's an entrepreneur, and that is that she uses her law degree every day. And that there's more to what she does that's related to the law than not. And that was exactly antithetical to what I thought, given, if you read her bio, how much she really is a businesswoman. Uh, in the true sense of the word, and an entrepreneur. She's the co-founder of the Sci-Fi Channel. Uh, the other co-founder is in the room, but I won't point him out. And um, she's also the co-founder and leads a couple other companies, including Hollywood.com, which is an entertainment uh, website that provides information um, on the entertainment industry. Um, MovieTickets.com, which actually I think sells uh, movie tickets. Um, she has her hands in the pot of some other companies as well, including a cable company that does internet and home security, and also a radio station, if I'm um, correct, five uh, radio stations. Um, she owns a turtle farm in Australia. <laughs> no, okay, okay, no, no. She How's doesn't. it doing? Uh, all right, um, but she, she is on the board of lots of different organizations, including the board of trustees at the University of Miami, uh, the advisory board of Law Without Walls, which is an international organization that builds legal startups, um, and as well, she's a mentor. Uh, she mentors um, different females throughout their career, and she truly is um, a, a, a representation of the future of law, it, the future for all of you, in terms of how you might use your law degree how you might decide to use your entrepreneurial and business skills in combination with your law degree. And I am sure if I stood up here, I could list a few more companies that she owns or runs or co-founds, but uh, I think you'd rather hear from her. So here's Lori. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Well, Michelle, that was, oh, thank you very much. I'm going to walk around with this because I can't figure, with all my technology background, I can't figure how to, I cook it on my clothes, so it's my little prop. Um, so uh, I am Laurie Silvers, and I am an attorney. And I went I went into the law thinking that I was going to be a, a lawyer. Imagine that, and that I would spend most of my time in the courtroom and practice a very a traditional uh, field, you know, a traditional life, if you would, as a lawyer. And I was very excited about it in high school. I took as many classes as I could in different areas, different disciplines. Um, but at the end of the day, I figured I would, I would be a trial lawyer. And actually, I did do that for a while. I practiced in front of um, uh, many courts, including criminal courts. It was interesting, exciting, but it wasn't for me. So it's interesting how you learn these things after you think that you've, you've got a direction, you know where you're going in life, and it's all planned out. And then when you get there, uh-oh, this doesn't really fit me. So I, I kind of made the switch from practicing uh, you know, having a, a bit of a criminal practice to a more traditional um, practice in business. And I found that I was representing a lot of people in the entertainment uh, ownership business. And what I mean by that, I was representing people that had um, ownership of cable systems, radio stations, television stations. And to be a good lawyer, you have to become a student of whatever it is that your client does. And I became a student. And I found that I was falling in love with communications and at that time I was falling in love with cable television. Now this goes way back uh, into the late 80s and back then uh, cable television didn't, that didn't resemble what it is today. Um, it was 64 channels. Uh, most cable systems were channel locked which meant that there were uh, there were 64 networks that were being brought into the home via the cable lines and that um, you know people had to enjoy what was being offered by the cable operator. So um, I decided that this is an exciting area. I love the technology of it and I love being able to get into people's homes and bring them uh, a more entertainment value. 
um, I decided I wanted to do this. I didn't want to just be the lawyer representing people that owned it. I wanted to own it. So I decided that the best way to do that was to dip my toe in the waters very quickly and look for a very small little cable system. And I found one. I was in Florida. The system was in Indiana. Um, and I mean, that made sense. It was a good system, and, and it, I was able to check off all the boxes. Went to the closing. The closing was great. The next day after the closing, my manager quit. That wasn't so good because I had to go back to Florida to my law practice, my family, my life. Um, and now I had this investment, um, my first stab at being an entrepreneur outside of the practice of law, and I didn't know what to do. What do you do? Well, you become an entrepreneur really quick, and you figure it out. You you hire people um, that sound like they're going to do a good job. They promise you they're going to do a good job. And you figure it out. And that's what an entrepreneur does. You figure it out. And having my law degree and being able to understand the contracts, because I had bought a business that really was based on contractual relations, uh, being able to understand those contracts was key. It was paramount. Uh, fast forward five years, owned it, grew it, did a very good job, brought in good people. And the, the real... The real key in being an entrepreneur is being able to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and being able to put together a good team. So um, I, whether it's a talent, whether it's something you learn, I'm not quite sure, but having yourself surrounded by people smarter than you will all, in the end, it will always make you look good. So as you go out, surround yourself with people smarter than you. You guys are all pretty smart. But believe me, there are people out there that you can learn from. And wh whether it's um, you know how to do a brief better, how to in uh, do an interview on a deposition better, get yourself around people that are better at it than you are, and you will come out better at the end. So that's just a little kernel of truth for you. So anyway, five years go by, um, sold the system, which had grown. It was now multiple systems, and decided, well, what do I do? I'm still fairly young. Um, wasn't going to retire. Did I want to go back to the practice of law, which I had not ever given up? Still continued to represent a few select clients who didn't want to give it up. I, I loved, I still do love the law, and I did love being a lawyer. So um, I decided I had to make a change. I, I had to do something. I was either going to go back into law or make uh, a, a new direction in business. So with my partner, who is sitting up there, Mitchell Rubenstein, who's also my husband, but don't hold that against me. Um, I decided that I wanted to create a cable network. Um, it's a little task for an entrepreneur based in Boca Raton, Florida, with absolutely no relationship with any of the big boy players. Why not, right? Why not? So how do you do that? How do you create something that massive on a national scale from scratch? The, uh, there's no book. Well, at the time there was no book. There probably isn't one now either. Because when you have a really big idea, something that's unique, you're a trailblazer, you're going to create, um, you're going to cut a path on the landscape, there really isn't a book out there that'll teach you how to do it. You have to rely on your own resources and you have to rely on a lot of your gut instincts. So what did I do? I went out and I bought for my office a whiteboard, similar to what's behind me, but that's black. I bought a whiteboard and I created what I consider to be the uh, building blocks of creating a national <coughs> cable network. Cable uh, network. Uh, okay, building block number one. Well, what's it going to be? What, what's, what's it going to be? So with my partner, we talked about the ideas and I said, I've got it. It's going to be the hair and makeup channel because all the women would love it. They all are concerned with their hair and makeup. It's going to be fantastic. Well, the first thing I had to do was convince um, my partner that this was a great idea. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Not the first time I've not been able to do something, but he came up with something that I did think was interesting, the sci-fi channel. OK, OK, it's, it's, um, I'm intrigued. I will tell you that I only think, uh, Forgive me, I only think the kind of nutty people are into science fiction. So, but I got it. I mean, I got that there were so many movies um, in the science fiction genre. So what did I do? I decided that first little block, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it the Sci-Fi Channel. So I filled in my first block. What's the next block? How do I create some gravitas? How, how do I get this going? 
Um, so the second was to do some grassroots research. And grassroots is another word for free. Uh, and when you're an entrepreneur and you don't have like, you know, baskets and baskets of money to, to throw at ideas, you have to be very clever and figure out how much information, how much research can you do for free. So I went to, uh, at the time, it was, it was really kind of the gold standard for what was happening in the entertainment world. I went to a blockbuster video. Does anybody know what that is? You do? Okay, we have a very uh, sophisticated person here in the audience. So I went to a Blockbuster. Why did I go to Blockbuster? Because I wanted to see what they were putting on their shelf space. What, because that's their, that's their real estate. That's, their, you know, that's where they make the money. So I looked at the genres. Well, you had comedy, you had drama, you had uh, kids, and science fiction. Science fiction is huge. It was huge. The titles that fell into science fiction, they also kind of mixed it in with fantasy and horror, but the titles that fell into it uh, were many, many, many. So that was good and that was encouraging because it, it told me, one, there was an audience out there, and two, there was product. And we'll get to that in just a minute, why that was so important. So also went to Barnes & Noble. Well, there's still a few of them around. Uh, and the same thing. It was the same exercise because their shelf space is their real estate and they have to, they have to put on there what, what's going to sell. They have to promote what's going to sell. And it was the same thing. But something interesting happened when I, was at, um, uh, when I was at Blockbuster. I asked the manager, I said, so you've got all these titles, but how successful are you? I mean, do people actually come in and rent them? And he said they rent them and it's very interesting because it's a phenomenon we don't see in any other genre. They rent them, and in, in, in those days when you rented something from Blockbuster, you had to bring it back or pay a, a fine. So they would rent them, timely, bring them back, and then rent them again. doesn't happen in another genre, but science fiction fans are fanatic. And if they like something, they'll watch it over and over and over. And, you know, they're not shy about telling you that. So I thought, well, this is really, this is really good. I, I like that. Okay, so we're, we're, uh, we've got the concept. We've done a little bit of research. Um, so now, how do I, that's good, now I'm convinced, okay, and, and it's important that I became convinced. Now that I'm convinced, how do I take this and dress it up so that I can go out and talk to people about it? Okay, so I had to do more than grassroots research. I had to conduct a national poll. I had to do something, uh, and it became the next square, if you will, the next block on my whiteboard. I had to do something that would be recognizable. Um, in the community at large, and I would be able to take it to uh, people when it came time to get financing and to get uh, cable operators to support it. And I commissioned a national poll through the Gallup organization. And at the time, um, I think Gallup is still around. They do, they do significant polling, but they were the gold standard of polling. And if you wanted anything done, whether it be in politics or entertainment, um, pharmaceuticals, you went to the Gallup organization and they would conduct a poll. Very impressive, very expensive, very time consuming, but well worth it because this was the first step that I actually threw money at this project. And, but it was key because if they came back and they said, you know, it, it, it's just, it's not out there. This market's not out there. The audience isn't out there. You're going to go down this road. You're going to spend years of your life and a lot of money and it's not going to happen. Um, and they were not afraid to come back uh, from, a, uh, from an experience where they're polling uh, in your particular discipline and say that. I'd heard where that had happened. Well, in my case, they came back and they said, it's phenomenal. They said, not only is it phenomenal, but we polled people that are used to watching um, traditional cable TV. At the time, it was CNN for news, it was the Weather Channel, uh, it was ESPN for sports, it was MTV for music. So all these classic networks. And, they, um, and, and the report basically said that everybody that's out there watching cable television will watch a sci-fi channel. Some people like it for the old, like the um, uh, sci-fi mystery theater, the sci-fi uh, old, old movies. And some people really want to watch the new science fiction, the more, the more technology-based science fiction. But it's out there. The audience is huge. Very important. Very important because that became my ally if I had to go out and talk to people, which as an entrepreneur, when you're selling something, you have to go out and talk to a lot of people. And this was something that nobody argued with. It, it was like the good housekeeping seal of approval. You said you had a national Gallup poll. These were the results. People accepted it. 
that's very important. If you're lucky to if you're lucky to be in a business or come up with an idea where you can get something like that, where people don't question its validity, you've got something very valuable. Okay, so now I have a I have a Gallup poll. Um, what what do I do next? What's next? What's next? What's my next square? What's my next square? I had to get credibility because science fiction fans they read science fiction, they watch science fiction, they talk science fiction. And I really shouldn't say they anymore. It's truly me. I'm, I'm a science fiction fan at this point in my life. Um, but I knew that if I went out and I tried to talk to somebody that read science fiction and great writing comes out of that genre, um, I'd make a fool of myself and I certainly wouldn't convince anybody. So how do you combat that? How do you, how do you attack that? You create a board of advisors. And you think you, you think you can figure out who is preeminent in the field that um, you know you're looking to to make the impact in. So in science fiction, at the time that I was doing this, um, Isaac Asimov was still alive. Anybody know Isaac Asimov? Okay, so Isaac Asimov is the um, I think he's kind of the father of all the literature that uh, started robotics. Uh, the, was it robots? Uh, the three laws of robotics. Um, interesting if he were here today to see where we are, how science fiction became science fact. Most of it does. Um, anyway, so took a chance, uh, figured out a way to make inroads and try and get a, uh, a meeting with Isaac and tell him about the concept of a science fiction channel dedicated to science fiction program 24 hours a day. Well, he liked it and he actually took a meeting. Now. I'm fast forwarding because we don't have a lot of time and I want to stop for questions and answers. It didn't happen quickly. It took a long time, uh, but it did happen. It did happen because it was a great idea. And it did happen because I thought of different ways to approach it. So he finally said, I'll meet you. Met him in New York. Um, he, said, I, he said, I really like this because I, I'm a writer, but nobody reads. So um, the fact that this is going to be programming on television and it's going to talk about space travel uh, and science, he said, you're going to be able to attract an audience that I'm not able to get to. And basically he was talking about young people. So he said, but I have a friend who uh, is very well known in the world of science fiction, has had tremendous success, and he owes me a favor because years ago when he was putting together his whole concept of science fiction travel, I was the one that told him, well, you've got to take the, um, the human um, and you've got to pair him up with the alien. And of course, the alien was Spock, and I'm talking about Star Trek. Does anybody know Gene Roddenberry? What do they teach you here at Harvard? <laughs> okay, well, Gene Roddenberry is the creator of Star Trek, um, and he was a dear friend of Isaac's, and Isaac uh, Asimov arranged for, um, for, for Mitchell and I to go out and meet him on the set of Paramount, where he was actually filming uh, a Star Trek movie. So Isaac and uh, Gene joined the board of advisors of the Sci-Fi Channel, not for the money, thank God, because I couldn't pay him, uh, but because they felt that uh, programming um, was a way to get to reach an audience that um, they felt really could benefit from science, space travel, and all the things that science fiction uh, is so well known for. So now I, had, I actually had a lot of building blocks over here. I had my board of advisors, and I, I had my concept, and I had my poll, etc., etc. So now what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Oh, I'm, i got to get programming. How do you have a network with no programming? And we're talking about programming for a network that was going to be on the air from day one, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's a lot of programming. So uh, the one thing that I knew, um, because I had been a cable operator, so the one thing that I knew was that most of the studios had programming and a programming library that they would license uh, to, to people to show um, on cable, well, on cable and on TV. So I contacted the studios and what I found was there was a lot of programming. Most of the programming though was not under science fiction. It was action adventure. So in the beginning it didn't all become clear to me that there was enough programming to keep this going. But once I figured out that action adventure was just another way of labeling science fiction and charging more money, because you can get more money for action adventure than you can for science fiction, it was clear to me that in addition to the studios, um, the BBC um, out, of, um, you know, out of England had a tremendous amount of programming that was also available. So it was, 
it was enlightening, it was wonderful, it was expensive. So I had found my programming, how do I pay for it? How do I pay for it? So I figured I had to go out and I had to start raising some money, but I wasn't ready yet. There was something missing. I had my programming, my poll, how was I going to get the network into the home? I needed a satellite transponder. That's science fiction that became science fact. Well, there were, at the time there were only two methods of getting, some, of getting programming into the home that wasn't traditional broadcasting. And it was, um, I mean there were only two companies that had satellite transponders. One was Hughes, as in Howard Hughes, his company. Um, and GE. And the Hughes organization didn't have any interest in talking to an entrepreneur. Can't say that I blame them. You know, entrepreneurs aren't always successful, and there's, there was limited space on, limited shelf space on these transponders that circle uh, the Earth and bring the satellite si signal um, down to Earth. So they wouldn't talk to us. But GE would. And GE believed in entrepreneurs. You would never think a big organization like that, a big company like GE. Why? Well, that was just their philosophy. And isn't that fantastic that one of the reasons that I, as an entrepreneur, was able to go the distance uh, with a concept this incredibly important and viable was because in the world at large, uh, most major companies are adverse to risk. Most entrepreneurs, it's all about the risk. So I had found the one company, GE, with the one thing that I absolutely had to have that embraced entrepreneurship. Sometimes it happens. In my case, I was lucky. Sometimes it doesn't. And I probably would still be up here, still talking to you about the launch of the Sci-Fi Channel, but I would have had to create a whole other way to get there. So this made it a little bit easier. So now I had programming. Now I had the way to deliver the channel into the home. What did I need now? I, I actually needed delivery. I needed cable operators that would sign up, that would, in fact, embrace this and believe it and as, again I did, it didn't exist we were in an environment where there were only 64 channels most cable systems were filled up if they wanted to put us on it meant that they had to kick somebody off which was hmm, problematic because every channel seems to have a, a fan site a fan base and they would get upset if you would uh, kick off their particular channel so it took a lot of selling on a lot of convincing um, and it took nine long months of going around the country you feel like you're running for national uh, political office you go everywhere you meet with every cable operator and you sell you sell and you sell and you tell them why this is going to be so incredibly important they're going to get more cable subscribers uh, they have to have it after nine months I had a meeting with the head of the company that owned the Weather Channel, and uh, but they owned other services besides that. But they owned a very large cable network, they a uh, cable uh, system, um, enough so that it would have it would have turned the tide. Had a meeting that was supposed to last for 30 minutes. They always last for 30 minutes, but this one kept going, and this one kept asking questions, and this one really was interested in the Sci-Fi Channel and why it was going to be a value at the end of the meeting, which went on for at least two hours. Um, I remember sitting across the table from this really great guy, and he said, I love it, and we're going to carry it. Show me your contract. What contract? <laughs> I didn't have a contract. I had never had that conversation before. This was nine months of selling. I didn't have a contract, but I'm a lawyer. I could make a contract happen. Okay, all right, all that schooling, all that work, all about being a lawyer, how did it come into play here? I said, I don't have it, it's at the hotel, I've got a couple more meetings, I'll be back tomorrow morning. Not a problem. I was back the next day with a contract. Wow, that was really neat. And we negotiated, and that became the contract. Throughout the entire sale of the Sci-Fi Channel to cable operators, that was the contract. Lori, were you doing contract work though, before this? Yeah. So you, so you went back and you, what did you do? How did you do it? Oh, to my hotel room? Yeah. Oh, you have no idea what I can do. <laughs> I mean, it was, and it was old school. I didn't have the internet. But I got my office on the line and we used fax. And I got the office, um, they have an office center at the hotel. What? I don't know if everyone knows what fax is. 
You know what faxes are. <laughs> PDF? Okay, they got it. Um, I, I mean, I made it happen. I just, you do it. You make things happen when you have to. But if I hadn't been a lawyer, I don't know what I would have done. I, I don't know. So that was the first time that my background as a lawyer really became important. And it, it, um, I, I, I'm sure I'd still be up here. I'd still be talking to you. But it would have been a different story. Something I would have gotten somebody on the phone. And who knows how good they were. I knew I was good. And I knew the business. I knew what was important. I knew what had to be in that contract because I was living and breathing it. So anyway, got that contract signed. We, uh, we embraced. She said, this is a great idea. Uh, I'm going to call my friends and I'm going to make sure that they meet with you and that they sign you up. Wow, that doesn't happen. But it happened because it was a really good idea. And I had done all my homework and I had done everything right. I had taken the time to do it right. And you know what? He did it. He called his friends and he had some very important friends. And he got me into places that I couldn't get into. And I had the opportunity to sell. Not everybody signed up, but most did. Because I had the uh, third party affirmation now of the system, um, of, of the system that was carrying us or would be carrying us once we launched. We weren't launched yet. So um, fast forward, a lot of things happened, went out to raise the money and needed to raise about a hundred million dollars. And this is back in the early 90s. I know there's always a calm in the room when I say that. You were all born in the early 90s, weren't you? Anyway, early 90s, $100 million, it was really a lot of money. And I had no idea how I was going to find it. Went the traditional route, went to um, Wall Street, see if I could raise it that way. Um, and the one, the one source that seemed like it would be the most viable for me was to go to strategics, go to people that were in the business already, understood the business, and see if, in fact, I could get you know, put it together with uh, enough people that had the, the financial wherewithal. You didn't need a hundred million dollars from day one. You just needed to have the money um, as part of your business plan so that you were able to pay for the tra satellite transponder. You were able to pay for the programming costs, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I went to, um, uh, I went to the uh, USA Network, which was owned at the time by the number one rated cable uh, network in the country, USA Network, owned at the time by uh, Paramount and Universal, uh, two major studios, major studios with huge libraries of science fiction programming. I figured they would totally get this. Well, they did totally get it. They totally got it. Um, I, and I, you know, I, I, I'm an honest person, so I have to say that actually Mitchell went to that meeting, and you were very sick at that meeting, and you made the presentation, did a great job. So I'm giving you credit, but that's it. I did everything else. Um, so anyway, the, um, the meetings went well. That first one and the subsequent meetings went very well. Uh, it was run by a woman, uh, Kay Koplovitz, who um, was a real leader in the world of programming and cable television, and a real fan of science fiction. Loved and understood how important and how strong uh, the audience for science fiction was and is. So um, after... Um, about four or five weeks of negotiating and discussing. She said, I love it. Um, I, I definitely want to do this with you guys. I have my partners to go to. I'm going to sell it to them. So she went back to her partners, um, Universal and Paramount. Um, and she came back and she said, they love it. But they don't want any partners. They're going to do it themselves. So this is what's going to happen. We're going to buy it from you or we're going to do it ourselves. You know, the world is a tough place. And um, so I could sell it to them and uh, with pride because they operated a great cable network. These were two great studios. They had the bulk of the science fiction programming that we needed to buy to uh, have for the channel. Or I could say, no, I've spent over four years of my life working on this. This is my baby. You do your thing, I'll do mine. Well, you know what happened. Um, I made the right choice because I don't think I could have gone up against, uh, against them and done it successfully. Perhaps I could have today, because there's so many uh, avenues of distribution. But they didn't exist back then. So it was kind of their way or the highway. Um, they kept us on for two years as um, executive vice chairman. Um, and basically, it was to sell to the cable operators uh, the story because it, there was nobody, there's nobody like an entrepreneur that is starting an, a business that has the passion. And I had the passion and I 
I, I, I did sell uh, a great many cable operators uh, to the concept to free up a channel and to uh, show the Sci-Fi Channel. So it was launched in 1992 and it was the second most successful launch of a cable channel ever, ever second behind Turner's TNT, but he launched TNT after he had CNN and he marketed the heck out of TNT on CNN. So that's an unfair advantage. And I would say if it was a level playing field, I would be number one, but hey. So uh, it was launched very successfully. And um, the, the interesting um, footnote to that was it was launched at the Hayden Planetarium. And it's, it's very dramatic. It's very dramatic when you launch a cable uh, channel. There's actually um, uh, a switch that's pulled. The screen had gone black and white for about 72 hours before the launch. And, and the switch is pulled down, and then all of a sudden it said, and a, a black screen appears. And it says, the Sci-Fi Channel will forever be dedicated to the memories of Isaac Asimov and Gene Roddenberry, both of whom had passed away shortly before we launched. So that was a very emotional moment. More, made more so by the fact that uh, May Jo Roddenberry was sitting on one side and Isaac's widow was sitting on the other. It was an emotional, exciting, incredible moment in my life, uh, in the life of every science fiction fan I know. But it was a change of the landscape forever because the, the, the science fiction channel, or now the SIFI channel, um, they, they changed the name for uh, whatever reason, I had nothing to do with that. Um, really was the brainchild of entrepreneurs from Boca Raton, which was unique. Somebody with such a big idea stepping out into an arena where only the, the, the major players have a spot. And being lucky in some cases, like the uh, experience with GE, where they embraced entrepreneurship. Um, I have a lot of time and stories I could dedicate telling you about the people that wouldn't take meetings, didn't believe in it, didn't believe an entrepreneur could do it, had no interest in funding it or supporting it. But it's more fun to talk about the successes. Um, I could always come back and talk about the other side, the dark side, but this really is more fun. But you don't get to the end of a story like this without going through a lot of tunnels and not seeing any light. Um, but you just keep soldiering on, a lot like the first year of law school. Um, anyway, so what have I done since then? Uh, and Michelle, you asked me, and you mentioned earlier, what about practicing law? Do I still practice law? I loved the law. And always, um, I always used to joke, well, when I'm done with everything I'm doing, I'm going back to law school and do it right this time. Um, I think I did it right the first time. I'm going to do it right again. Well, I'm not really going to go back to law school, but I do practice law every single day. And I'm going to tell you why. In the businesses that I own, and um, I'm a founder of, and one of the creators of the technology that created online ticketing. Um, my company is uh, movietickets.com, and I hope that you all buy your tickets online through movietickets.com. If you don't, you're missing a great opportunity. Um, I'm also one of the founders of, uh, the, of Broadway.com, which was a huge seller of Broadway tickets throughout the U.S. and internationally, and I sold that. And that was created from a URL, Broadway.com. And um, radio stations, which I've owned for many, many years, um, cable, cha cable operations uh, in South Florida, where I'm based. But we live in an environment, and this probably will be music to your ears, we live in an environment that is extremely litigious. I really have a lawsuit. I'm either, um, I'm either being sued or I'm suing in one of my companies almost all the time. And that's just the way it is. You try to negotiate, you try to make things go away. Sometimes you can't because it's just not right. Um, but being a lawyer has been incredibly helpful to me in my career. Being a woman lawyer has been incredibly helpful to me in my career. I remember in the early days, and I, I hope none of you have this at all, but in the early days, um, I would attend meetings as a woman and it was, I would be dismissed. I wasn't told to leave the room, but it was very dismissive because, you know, women just didn't get the things that, you know, men did. But when it was established that I was a woman lawyer, 
all of a sudden the perception changed. And so that was very important to me um, in business, in creating the, um, the right, the appropriate atmosphere that was necessary to get my message across. So, you know, cut down those barriers and let's just, you know, let's just get to the matter at hand. Let's talk about the business. Um, but anyway, going back to my business is all about contracts, negotiations. Um, being in business, you have to know all the rules and regulations when it comes to hiring and firing employees. Um, I have great managers in everything that I do. Um, they're very smart, but I'm the crisis manager. And when things go wrong, and they always do, I'm the one that has to come in and kind of clean it up. And the legal background serves me very well. I don't have an MBA, so I don't know if I'd be talking in, you know, you know, a different, from a different perspective if my background was an MBA in business. But I think law gives you tools um, a perspective, a focus, an understanding of ideas and concepts that I don't know how you get through business today without it. I really, I really don't. I think it's that important. So for those of you that are focused on becoming, uh, going down a more traditional path and working in a large firm, um, again, I think you'll all have to become students of whatever the business is that you may be uh, working with or around or about. Uh, and for those of you that want to use the tools and, and want to use your law degree to go out and be an entrepreneur, good for you. Because I think that the tools uh, that you learn in law school are they're fundamental changers. You, you will never be the same. You know, you enter as a 1L and when you exit uh, at, at graduation, you're not the same as when you started out. You are different. I think you're better. Um, but you understand, I think you have a different understanding of a lot of the issues in life that perhaps you might have uh, let go by you without stopping and examining them um, in, in detail. And those are the skills that you learn as a lawyer. So I have a lot more I could talk about, but I, I'm, my eye is on the clock because I want to open it up for some Q&A. Um, but those are the, the few remarks that will uh, kind of conclude who I am and why I'm here today. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Can I ask a question? I want to take it sort of in a different direction. A lot sure. of people who are friends in the entertainment industry, that we see a lot where art imitates life and life imitates art. I'd like you to speak to how, as a lawyer, uh, your values and your commitment to the rule of law play into your, or have played into your decision-making process. Not so much in the production, side of what should should these studios and what should these networks be producing. But so much of your money comes from sponsorships uh, from corporations who are not necessarily engaged in the art, but are engaged in the art of producing your films, but who may also be bad actors in uh, uh, a national economy. How much do your, does your advice to your client and your values ethically play into the art of the production of your materials, and should it? Hmm. That's a really good question, and uh, wow, that's a that's a really good question. And I, you know, I would have to start my response by saying, well, it depends on the players. Uh, it depends, and and you have all kinds of players um, in the the creation and development of entertainment product. You have your traditional studios that are out there making the blockbusters. It is. They're big companies, uh, and while the the um, the concept of creating a movie is very sexy and everybody is excited about entertainment, at the end of the day, it's business. At the end of the day, they have X dollars going into it, and they have to know what's going to be coming out and how can they make it successful. I, you know, I, I'm not a producer of entertainment product. My my world has always been around it, but I've never been a producer of it. So my guess would be, in that case, the legal talent that would be involved would be helping them to create the contracts, to create the business product, and make a lot of money. But that world is very diverse. You have what we just talked about is on one end. But on the other end, you do have very committed people, the documentarians, the, the people that really have a passion about a subject and they'll go after it. And there's not much money. There's more money in documentaries now than there used to be, but there's not 
um, a lot of money, not like you get from any of these major studio uh, powerhouse films. Uh, and there are those that there are those people that go out and they make the, the little small films, the independent films, uh, that are you know catching a lot of uh, credibility. We have all of these festivals that are basically all about the small film, and they are getting a lot more money uh, and a bigger part of the entertainment enterprise is paying attention to them. But as the lawyer, it's hard. It would be hard. It would be hard to advise your client uh, not to deal with a certain provider of uh, entertainment product, whether it's uh, from the actor or product placement, uh, if you will, if, we, if it's known that it's a, uh, a, a, a bad actor. So it, it, would be, it would be something very personal. And again, uh, who is the lawyer? And, and what are their feelings? What is their commitment? You know, how do they feel about helping from a strict business perspective? Or do they want to have uh, a bigger play, a bigger role? Does that kind of answer your question? Sure. I mean, we know that Disney has a, has a big moral commitment. Right. A fiduciary obligation to right. the audience. And they have strict guidelines. And you know, their lawyers try to adhere to that. But, I, I'm wondering but that comes from the company. Right. That's the, that's the corporate philosophy. And that comes from the management. You know, if management changes, which we all read, it's going to, not the way they thought, um, it, that could change too. Highly unlikely in the case of Disney, but there are other studios that may not have that philosophy now, but in fact, uh, with new management, uh, may, in, may in the future. So it's, it's interesting because the world of entertainment uh, is so influential. You know, people see it, they believe it, um, most people, uh, you go to the, you go to your entertainment provider, whether it's your iPhone or it's the IMAX. Um, if you, you know, if you see it, you think it's so. So there, there is an obligation, there is a responsibility, but not everybody sees it. Any other questions? Lori. Yeah. So you're working in a very um, highly regulated industry related to other industries that are also highly regulated. Have you been... How has um, the world changed in the last 10 years from a compliance and regulatory standpoint? Are you having to hire extra people in that area, and has that affected you at all? Well, frankly, the only business that is uh, highly regulated would be my, tele my radio properties. Um, that is highly regu regulated. Um, cable television uh, is not, no. Um, which makes it very challenging when you are competing against, I mean, for the broadcasters who are competing against cable, which um, has a whole separate set of standards it imposes upon itself, but not through the FCC. I'm going to go back to what I said before. Whether it's oversight, governmental oversight, or whether it's just living in this environment that we're in, you have to have a lot of legal talent because you are constantly doing something legal-esque, whether it's defending or pursuing uh, a lawsuit, uh, whether it's filings for the FCC, uh, whether it's, you know, everything that I do has funding, so there's banking uh, involved, which you know, requires a lot of commitment and oversight as well. You do need a lot of legal talent uh, in business today. You can't, you just, I can't even imagine not having it. So hiring more people, hiring good people, yeah. Uh, when you went to the meeting with USA and they, they gave you the buyout offer, were you expecting that or were you kind of surprised by that? It, from the, the way you told it, it sounded like you were kind of surprised or was that part of your overarching business plan? Oh no, that was not part of my plan, right. ever, ever. You know, surprised. Um, but not shocked because that was the, you know, when you go to a strategic, you're going to somebody who basically does a similar same thing as you do and has a significant understanding of what you do. So bear in mind, I knew, they knew, they had the bulk of the library of programming that was needed to get this channel going with uh, programming 24 hours a day. Um, and they already had a channel that had 100% distribution. So they knew that, they had that. Um, 
I wasn't shocked. I was sadly surprised. But no, I, it was never, it was never what I wanted to do. That was, that was something. And if you had known that that was going to happen, would you maybe have rethought that decision to go to go and Well, gosh, yourself? hindsight's a great thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I do get that question asked a lot. Would I have not gone there? Probably not. Probably not. Does that mean that they wouldn't have launched it on their own? Mm, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Remember, the, the woman that ran USA Network uh, was a real fan of science fiction and understood it. Um, if they had launched in um, uh, opposition to the Sci-Fi Channel, I don't think I ever would have gotten the funding. It would have been very difficult to, to back an entrepreneur when somebody so established, so well-known, so successful doing what I wanted to do was already out there. When you got the bio proposal, uh, with the details of it such that it sort of gave you an ongoing incentive to, your interests were tied together in some way, so you might not formally be a partner, but you become a shareholder or one of what, whatever they were, so that you could, your missionary zeal promote the channel wouldn't be undercut, because I, the, the feature about keeping you on for a couple of years is a very common thing in takeover sure. situations. But if you really had the missionary zeal, uh, I would imagine it would be very deflating to not feel that your fortunes were in some ways tied together economically going forward. Uh, so I, I don't know how much you can say, can or want to say about you know what the deal was that did it, was it something that gave you a, an ongoing stake in their success. Did I get to keep this much <laughs> equity in the deal? No. And uh, that was never on the table. That was never on the table. There, I mean, I, I was, it was a nice deal. It was, it was, it was okay. Um, but no equity. That was not part of the deal. Um, and when you're negotiating and one party has so much of the deck on their side, uh, you negotiate your way through it. Yeah. That's, you know, that's just the way it is. Any other questions? Yeah. So having had the experience with USA, when you had the idea, but it was kind of a, you know, stolen, so to say, or it was about to be stolen? No, it wasn't stolen. Yeah. No, it but wasn't they were, if, if you had not, let's say, sold the company, what would happen? They will take your idea and they will develop their own company and then you will not be able to couldn't trademark this. I couldn't trademark science fiction. Right. Science fiction is out there. Um, so, and, and this was four years of my life and I was always concerned that somebody else would just take my idea and run with it. Now, I had presented the whole concept to them and we had NDAs signed and all that good legal stuff that I knew as a lawyer needed to be done because I really wasn't being advised by lawyers at this point. It was I was advising myself and the company. Um, which, if they just stole it and it wasn't a, a purchase, uh, there would have been liability. I don't know what would have happened. I would have pers vigorously pursued all of my legal rights, but I don't know what would have happened in that case. Um, but I was always concerned because I, uh, you know, once I started going out and making presentations, I was out there and there are uh, magazines uh, in the in cable industry. They were offering interviews. I was talking about it. I was going to cable shows. I was setting up booths. I was um, presenting to cable operators and trying to get them to sign contracts. Um, I was out there and people knew about the sci-fi channel and I at this point believed it was such an incredibly strong concept I found it hard to believe that somebody else wasn't launching it like a Disney or a Warner or a USA Network I was surprised that they weren't but I had one asset on my side and that was they were big companies and the economy was not that robust at that point big companies are risk adverse um, and so it, gave, it opened up an opportunity for an entrepreneur and uh, that was my advantage. One thing I want to add to that is there's the theory of multiples, and the theory of multiples is that um, inventions and discoveries and ideas happen around the world within a couple days, hours of each other, the silicon chip, oxygen, even Darwin's theory of evolution. 
Does anyone even know who the other guy is and what his name was? Oh, sorry to tell you, but uh, your theory of revolution isn't going to happen because Darwin didn't do it. Um, and that's because the world starts to come around at the same time, going through the same things, and there are people all over the world studying the same things. And every venture capitalist I've ever talked to, and I've talked to tons, will say, ideas are a dime a dozen. And if you ask me to sign an NDA, your idea is not good enough. Because you should be going out and telling everybody your idea and getting everybody's adv advice and stealing everybody's advice and ideas to make it better and better and better and better and better. And that um, venture capitalists invest in the person. And Lori doesn't talk about this, but one of the reasons why she's so successful is because she's what people that invest in entrepreneurs want, which is someone that's going to sell even though you don't have equity, someone who believes in their idea, somebody who's not afraid of failure, and somebody who really, really feels passionately regardless. And so venture capitalists will invest in an entrepreneur. And another thing that you, you didn't mention that you were is we're first. And right. being first, right. a first mover can really help. Right. There were um, a couple of copycats, but they were also entrepreneurs. And they had no funding, and they couldn't get anybody to pay attention because we had done. We we were working with the GEs. I had Isaac and Gene Roddenberry. I had these incredible libraries of uh, programming that I, because of my previous business uh, businesses, I had the the finances to do that. Not enough to launch it, but enough to do all those important things. So I was able to starve off the other entrepreneurs. I couldn't have gone up against a Disney, and that's and but I didn't have to. Because they, although I went to Disney, they didn't see it. And they didn't want to be, they didn't want to take the risk. So one more question or are we done? Okay. Well, I obviously covered it brilliantly. <laughs> uh, thank you all for your attention. I do appreciate it. This was great fun for me to come tell you the story. And I wish you all lots of good luck no matter where you, you wind up. Thank you. Thank you.